He spent years in the recording industry. He is Alan Horbath of New Jersey. This man from North Brunswick shares his spiritual, personal beliefs, a very important part of what he's always been about, a very significant aspect concerning what has always inspired him to write and perform. His spiritual studies began at an early age, beginning with the scriptures and advancing to books like the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Lost Books of the Bible. When he was a teen, he started questioning what religion was all about. He had friends that were Catholics, Jews, Protestants, atheists, Buddhists. His dad had always instructed him that there were many religions and philosophies in the world as there were men, but he only found the truth in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father through the Word. Alan Horvath has an interesting story. His Syrian background and turning to the Aramaic Hebrew background, his background brought him to the truth, the scriptures as they were originally penned. Alan Horvath tells us the rest of the story. I grew up here in, in central New Jersey, what used to be called Franklin Township, and as a little boy, I was around people that spoke Aramaic all the time. My grandfather came from Syria to America, spoke Aramaic, he was a street preacher, his Bible was written in Aramaic, and a lot of times I would ask him, you know, what does this mean in English? And I would see the difficulty he would have in trying to give me the right understanding of a particular word. I guess that kind of set me up because knowing that the Father's Word was written in Aramaic Hebrew as I got older, you know, actually I started reading the Word when I was 12 years old. Never belonged to any religion or church. It was just always me on a personal level studying the Word with a prayer life. And when I was 17 years old, I quit school when I was 16, 17. I went out to Los Angeles and started a career in the music industry as a singer-songwriter. And that went on for well, more than 30 years. But my walk with the Father was always, I maintained that, that personal walk. And as I went on in my studies, knowing that the word was written in Aramaic Hebrew, I knew that the English was not painting the right picture. And that's what led me to where I am now, where I go back to the most ancient letter form known, and that's a pictographic form in, uh, in Hebrew that's called odiot, meaning letters. Or actually, more accurately, meaning signs. And there's 22 letters. So what I'll do is someone will ask me a question about a particular scripture, and I'll take the key words. For example, we're saved by grace through faith. So I'll take the word grace and the word faith, and I'll find the original spelling in Aramaic Hebrew and present the letter form and paint the picture of what each word reveals. And so being saved by grace through faith becomes being saved by by pitching your tent with the Father through growing in and being washed by His Word. And that, you know, paints this wonderful picture. And so now, you know, I'm retired from the music industry and I spend all my time answering people's questions on YouTube and making these videos. What makes it so unique and why does it not transliterate well into the English and, and where did we go wrong here? We didn't go wrong. It's just that we're taking an Eastern mindset and then trying to interpret it with a Western mindset. And here's the problem. With an Eastern mindset, if you asked our Messiah, what's a pencil with his Eastern mindset? And, you know, we are told that we are to have the mind of the Messiah. Well, his mind would answer that question and say, well, it's something I write with. That's the Eastern mindset speaking. If you ask someone, what's a pencil with a Western mindset? And they'd say, well, it's this yellow stick and it has a point on one end and a pink rubber ordeal on the other end. The Western mindset looks at form and the Eastern mindset looks at function. So, you know, even using something like Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible, where you can look up the original Aramaic Hebrew word that was used in a particular scripture, and then you look for the definition, well, they're trying to define it, an Eastern concept, with Western notions and ideas. Is. And a lot of times you look up a word and it'll, they'll give you so many different definitions that are in so many different ballparks. It's crazy because you'll see the word here, let's say like spirit, the word for spirit is actually ruach. And so, you know, the interpreters, they'll see, well, here it's talking about the father's spirit.
spirit, so they'll say spirit. And in another scripture, it's talking about, like, the wind. So they'll say, oh, well, it means wind. And they'll come up with all these different things that really just get you more confused. And the problem is, it's the Father's word is written in such a way that it, it's really not about words or language as much as it is about pictures and ideas and a way of thinking. As we look at the events of the world today, all eyes appear to be on Jerusalem and all eyes appear to be on both the book of Revelation, Ezekiel, and other books that point to the end of days. Yeah. Taking your application of this, how does it differ in terms of the interpretation through Aramaic than what we see in, say, the New King James or the King James version of the Bible today? Well, the prophecies are pretty well understood and I cover those on my YouTube channel as well. But also, every Tuesday, a 15-minute newscast, I really focus on all the wars and rumors of wars that are going on in the world. And, of course, they're really happening in the Middle East. And, for example, let's say this week or last week, you won't hear any reports of anything going on in the Middle East. If you watch my news, you'll see that there are dozens of wars and rumors of wars going on. And, you know, too, Zephyr, Aniah, chapter 3, verse 9, the Father says that in the last days, he's going to return his people, those who really love him, to a pure, you know, the English always says a, a pure speech or a pure lip or a, a clean language. And I think he's talking about what I'm teaching with these, these letter forms. He's going to return those who love him to this pure understanding of what his word says. And no one else is doing it. I talked to a gentleman just a few days ago. He's been studying these ancient pictographic letter forms for 10 or 15 years, much longer than I have. And he says, Alan, he says, you know, you're the only other person I know who's studying this. We believe the Lord was speaking. I believe it's a prophecy being fulfilled, that this is the purer understanding that the Father said he was going to reveal in the last days. And then, you know, like you said, prophecies are unfolding in ways that we have, that could never have been seen before. Things are really ramping up and speeding up. Ezekiel is bursting alive. Give us some examples, Alan. Well, you know, Ezekiel 38 and Psalm 83 are very interesting because they're both talking about Israel being surrounded by all the neighboring countries. They want to nail Israel. Well, if you look at it, Ezekiel 38 and Psalm 83, all the countries mentioned in one are not mentioned in the other. Now, so I've looked at that closely. I believe Ezekiel 38 is going to happen after Psalm 83 because Ezekiel 38 there's all these nations surrounding Israel and they want to attack Israel to take her spoils and, you know, when I thought about that, I said, well, Psalm 83 could be first. They want to wipe Israel off the map. And, of course, that's become a common catchphrase in today's news with Iran. Israel's going to win that war. And she's going to gain a lot of land. You know, Israel's about the size of New Jersey right now. But Israel's going to become huge. The Father's going to give back or restore the land that he originally gave to Israel. So Psalm 83 happens. Israel wins. Israel gets bigger and has a lot more than Ezekiel 38. They go after Israel for her spoils and no one supports Israel in Ezekiel 38 except the father. He fights all of Israel's battles. Anyone who wants to attack Israel has got to be crazy. They always lose. They always will lose. And all of that brewing right in front of our eyes. Alan, it's often been said that America is not mentioned at any point in scripture or even alluded to. What has your studies shown? Well, in Ezekiel 38, it talks about the merchants of Tarshish and all her villages right there. The merchants of Tarshish, I believe, would refer to Britain. And then all her villages would refer to America, Canada, and Australia because we came from Britain. But, you know, I think America is not mentioned because, first of all, the Father's Word is all about Israel. And even when it talks about the world, sometimes I wonder if it's not just talking about the Middle East, which is a possibility. For example, the Antichrist really is the wrong name for him because anyone who says that the Messiah is not the son of the Father is Antichrist. Really, it's the lawless one. But this bad guy we see in, in Revelation says that he's going to wind up ruling the whole world. That could just be talking about the Middle East. America might not be there because 
she really isn't as important to Bible prophecy. You know, we think of America as being the kingpin because of our lifetimes, but America has been the kingpin for 200 years in a 6,000 year story. And America is falling apart at a speed that staggers me. Like, you know, this country is not what it was when I was growing up. That's over with. You know, I think, I think when the word talks about Babylon, I think it means Babylon. But mystery Babylon is something to be studied. What is, in fact, in your definition, mystery Babylon? I think it's a title and it's a name. This title is written on her forehead. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. You know, mystery, again, Western mindset, we're not talking about an Alfred Hitchcock movie. <laughs> In the word, when you see the word mystery, it's referring to a secret that is now being revealed. Whenever you see the word mystery, it's not a mystery. It's talking about information that the Father has withheld until now it's being revealed. Babylon, you're talking about Iraq, and secret is revealed perhaps about Iraq. The mother of prostitutes, the abominations of the earth. It makes me think of Islam. Allah, in the Quran, it says that Allah has no son. And, you know, they say, oh, Allah, that means God. Well, which God? If Allah has no son, you're not talking about the Father and the Creator of all things because we know He has a son that He loves very much, and that is our Messiah. So the mother of prostitutes, the abominations of the earth, all these false gods, Islam, I believe that Allah is Satan himself and that the Mahdi of Islam is the lawless one that everyone refers to is the Antichrist. And, you know, there again, talk about prophecy. The Quran gives the same prophecies as the Bible. It's just a little bit twisted. Uh, you know, their Mahdi is going to return and bring seven years of peace and so on and so forth. All of this, you know, the water is boiling in the pot. It's about time to turn off the fire and pour a cup. We've been speaking with Alan Horvath. Alan, if people would like to connect with you and your ministry, how would they go about it? The best thing is go to youtube.com slash watch Alan. And that's watch a-L-A-N. Or they can go to my website, alanhorvath.com. A-L-A-N-H-O-R-V as in victory, A-T-H. alanhorvath.com or youtube.com slash watch Alan, A-L-A-N. If you'd like more information about Alan Horvath, check him out at alanhorvath.com and his YouTube channels with more than 280 unique teachings. That's alanhorvath.com.